All this is Dr. Mobeen Sayed from drbean.com. Hope you're doing well, you're staying safe, and you are staying protected. Today, I wanted to go over a few set, a set of news that have been uh, circulating in media. Some of those are intriguing, some of these are concerning, some of these are interesting and, and uh, good. So I wanted to make sure that we go over them. We can dig deeper into these studies individually later on, but I wanted us to kind of go over them and see those news and start thinking about what may be right and what may not be. So let's dive right in. Welcome everyone, and I'm gonna start the discussion. So the first thing to notice, and this uh, data will be useful when we are discussing these studies. If you see here, we have 24, more than 24 million cases so far that have been identified. Of course, the number of people who are infected are much more than this, but these are the confirmed cases. So with this, let's start with our discussion. The very first news is, and this is a study as well, it is coming out of Italy. And what they have done is they have done a retrospective observational study. What that means is that they went back, they looked back at the data for 33 of the clinical centers in Italy. And then they, they took that data for the patients who were given hydroxychloroquine versus the patients who were not given hydroxychloroquine. And important note for the cool beans over here is that the discussion, this study is showing is about the patients who are hospitalized. So we have been doing this discussion that it is possible that hydroxychloroquine is more useful in the early phases. However, the study is for the later phase. Even then, the study concluded that the patients that were given hydroxychloroquine, they had 30% reduction in mortality in hospitalized patients. So 30% reduction in death rate. So that is significant. Again, we can go into the data later on as a separate study if you like, but it is interesting for us to look at that study as well. So here is the study. This is the article about it, and I believe this is the study. It is published here in the internal medicine as well, and it is published in some other journals too. The study says use of hydroxychloroquine in hospitalized COVID-19 patients, hospitalized, is associated with reduced mortality. Finding from the observational multi-center central Italian chorist study. So if you see here the results, let's look at them. Out of 3,451 COVID-19 patients, 76.3% received hydroxychloroquine. Death rates per 1,000 persons days for patients receiving or not HCQ were 8.9 and 15.7. So that is the main important gist of the, the study here, that the patients who were receiving hydroxychloroquine, they had the death rate of 8.9% while the patients who were not receiving hydroxychloroquine, they had 15.7% death rate. I like the study a lot because what they have done is they have actually discussed that hydroxychloroquine has been uh, a political thing and it, some people say use it and others say don't use it. And they talked about recovery trial as well, that hydroxychloroquine was used as a, in the trial, then it was stopped because of that study, which that fraudulent study, and then it was resumed and then it was stopped again. So they they are aware of all of that. And they are also aware of two retrospective observation studies, both conducted in New York metropolitan region, did not report any significant association between ACQ and the rates of intubation or death. So they are aware of all of that. Then they went in and they did the study. And I love this study because the data that they have shown is very interesting and exhaustive, and their method on that is exhaustive as well. So um, the primary outcome, if you see here, out of 3,628 patients, 576 died, 16.7%. 2,319 were discharged alive, 69.3%, and 
and 485, 14% were still at the hospital. The median follow-ups was 14 days and death rate per thousand was 8.9 in ACQ and 15.7 in non-HCQ. So this is a very, very important study to keep in mind. And what I wanted to do was, in light of our yesterday's discussion about bradykinin storm and the previous discussions of the cytokine storm, I wanted to kind of remind the cool beans that we discovered together in our discussions for last couple of days that the hydroxychloroquine, zinc, and vitamin D actually have more mechanisms than what we had already discussed. So one of the mechanism we saw was hydroxychloroquine. And this is what we saw in the um, complement system lecture. So that is two days before this lecture, in which we saw that hydroxychloroquine reduces the autophagy. And I hope you remember that autophagy reduction meant that if I go over here, the neutrophils, when they are working against the virus, so neutrophils are also like macrophages or dendritic cells. They eat up the virus, they break it down, they do a respiratory burst on it, they put bleach on it, and they, they burn it. And that is how they break the viruses. And then after doing some work, so maybe let's say after killing 1,000 viruses, I do not know the right number, so I'm just making up a number here. After killing 1,000 viruses, then what the neutrophils do, they kill themselves as well. And that is called autophagy. The problem is that when a cell kills itself or it dies because of the infection, the broken down pieces that are released from the virus, they are chemotactic and chemoattractant for more of the immune system. And they are also, as we saw yesterday, these would also cause the tissue factor release. And these would also cause the calicrin release, which would then cause the bradykinin storm as well. So this is an interesting um, uh, final common pathway for both of the systems, cytokine storm and bradykinin storm. They both at the end end up in causing cell damage and then get amplified. And hydroxychloroquine works in this area to prevent the cell death. So that means hydroxychloroquine is not, in, not only interesting in the cytokine storm and the viral stage, it can now also be interesting to calm down the bradykinin storm. So for all those folks who are against hydroxychloroquine, here is one more thing that hydroxychloroquine, even if we say that the bradykinin storm is the actual storm and not the cytokine, or maybe they both are, hydroxychloroquine actually works for both. So that is a very interesting uh, outcome that we learned together. Then the second part was zinc. And zinc is what we saw yesterday. Does anyone remember? So autophagy, auto, A-U-T-O, auto means self, phagy means eating. So eating the self, that means killing the, the one's own self or suicide of a cell. So autophagy is when a cell has done in, enough work, then it kills itself to keep the immune system in balance. Otherwise, if immune cells just keep working forever, then they would cause autoimmune diseases. So these cells are either suppressed by other cells or they kill themselves. For example, when a macrophage has done 100 eatings of the other damaged cells or the pathogens, then the macrophage itself dies. So that is called autophagy. But whenever a cell breaks down, I'm responding to a comment here uh, that somebody is asking, I think James, Kelly is saying, autophagy, I think when a cell dies, it, it is apoptosis. Am I wrong? You are correct. Apoptosis means cell death. However, when a cell causes its own death, then we call it that apoptosis is called autophagy. Cell can be asked to kill itself by other mechanisms as well. For example, we, we know that viruses and other infections can cause a cell to kill itself, then there can be the ischemic dis, uh, distress or the nutritional distress can also trigger a cell to kill itself. So there can be external mechanisms that can cause the cell to kill. For example, natural killer cells also cause the cells to kill themselves. But when a cell decides to kill its own self, then that is called autophagy. And that is what we're talking about here. So autophagy, we saw this in the complement system and hydroxychloroquine works there. Then zinc, zinc, we know that it is a 
hydroxychloroquine and quercetin are zinc ionophores. And we know that the zinc's function is at an antiviral stage. It blocks the RDRP enzyme, which helps in the replication of the virus. However, we also saw that zinc would inhibit calicrin. And we saw that calicrin, this enzyme yesterday, remember the monster we drew yesterday? Calicrin causes the kinins to be converted to bradykinin, which then in turn causes the uh, vasodilatation and, and uh, pain and edema and those things. So zinc actually can block calicrins. And so it can reduce the production of bradykinin, which would then calm down this storm. So bradykinin storm can also use some zinc. It can use hydroxychloroquine. And if it can use zinc, although in this case of bradykinin storm, the zinc is not needed to be with a, with a zinc ionophore because this is the zinc that can work outside on the calicrin. Calicrin is present in the tissue fluids and in, in the blood. It is not inside the cells. So zinc can actually just go directly and work on it. So this is another very interesting mechanism of zinc. So we have been talking about take hydroxychloroquine and zinc. Here is another reason for using it. And the third one, vitamin D. Vitamin D, one function of the vitamin D is to increase intracellular um, calcium. And what happens is that when inside the cells, calcium is increased. So if this is a kidney and if the kidney cells have more calcium in them because we have vitamin D, then the cell causes reduced renin production. And we know that the renin production would then cause angiotensinogen to be converted into angiotensin 1, which would then be converted to angiotensin 2, which is then pro-inflammatory plus vasoconstrictor. We have been talking about this for four months now. Here, vitamin D, in the yesterday study, which we saw with the supercomputers, what the, the bradykinin storm study, what they found was that the vitamin D gene expression was less in COVID-19 patients. So let me show you that. So if I go here, this is the study which we discussed yesterday, that is the bradykinin storm. But one paragraph that is of interest for us to see is given this model, factors that affect renin angiotensin system balance should be further investigated. So here they are saying vitamin D deficiencies have re recently been associated with severity of illness in COVID-19 patients. Our bronchoalveolar lavage gene expression analysis shows that the VDR is twofold down regulated. What are they saying here? What is this science they're talking about? What they're saying is that in the cells, any cell, there are vitamin D receptors. Vitamin D goes in and works with those receptors and does its function. And they are saying that COVID-19 patients have two times lesser vitamin D receptors which then causes increased renin production, renin production, which then would cause the cytokine storm. So here they're saying if you give vitamin D, it actually reduces the bradykinin storm through reduction of the renin system. So we have now the cytokine storm and we have bradykinin storm and the drugs for both of them, the common drugs, hydroxychloroquine, zinc, and vitamin D, vitamin D. Don't we feel proud as cool beans that we have been talking about these drugs for some time and we have been uh, using vitamin D as well. So this is one thing. Now I wanted to put one more comment in, in here that yes, vitamin D can cause calcium regulation or increase the calcium, which can then in turn can cause calcifications and stones and other things. Here, I think we are talking about vitamin D slightly higher doses for a shorter period of time till this pandemic is over. So it is not a 10 years usage of vitamin D or 20 years. Normally, we will use vitamin D in prescribed low doses. But here, it is actually OK to be a little higher. So this is very, very interesting that the vitamin D hydroxychloroquine and zinc. Is there any cool bean who can tell me what are the 
functions of hydroxychloroquine. Now we have one more. So remember, hydroxychloroquine reduces intracellular, uh, sorry, acidity or increases the pH, which in turn causes reduction in the virus uh, fusion. It causes RDRP to function less. It causes the viral replication to reduce and stall because the enzymes cannot work correctly. It causes the glycation. It inhibits the glycation of the ACE2 receptor, which then reduces the binding of the virus. So virus binding to the cell is reduced. Virus fusion to the cell is reduced. Virus replication in the cell is reduced. So that is how the hydroxychloroquine works. And then we also know now that hydroxychloroquine would help reduce the cytokine or bradykinin storm as well. So um, hopefully this much is good. And now let's continue with the discussions, uh, with the news. And again, if you would like, I can go deeper into various parts of the discussions we are doing today. But I wanted us to catch up to the current news that are out in the media because there were some, uh, this hydroxychloroquine is a good news. But this a man was reinfected. I thought that was not exactly um, called for the way the media is running with it. So I want to show you what I mean by that. So here is one of the articles. It's in Discover. A man was reinfected with coronavirus after recovery. What does this mean for immunity? And then here is the, another article in Stat News. First COVID-19 reinfection documented in Hong Kong, researchers say. And then they say this is the first in the world and blah. So look, number one, Hong Kong University has not actually released all the data for us to understand the health of the patient, for us to understand the um, any comorbidities, for us to understand did he have what kind of tests were done and lots of other things. In addition to this, I want to first go back to our opening statement that we have about 24 million cases now, more than 24 million. If reinfection was that possible and that common, then reinfection will be everywhere. 24 million people are out there who are infected and more than them are out there actually who were infected. We have not counted them all. And then here is one case. And so running with this to say, well, the this, the sky has fallen, we, we have reinfection. So let me show you some of the data that I collected and my opinion on this. And again, I can only offer my opinion because from the immunology books and previous immunology discussions, we know that it is not that easy for SARS-CoV-2 to reinfect us that easily. So what is going on? Let's talk about it. Number one, the man is 33 year old. So that is, he's a young man. Hopefully he doesn't have too many comorbidities or doesn't have any comorbidities. They say that this is the first infection. So he got his first infection in March. Then he traveled. Then he came back on with and had a second infection. Patient was asymptomatic. They do not know if he was transmitting as well or not. But now tell me this, maybe when he was flying, there were other patients in the plane. And I do not know from that data if that is true or not. And maybe he, he received some virus in his oropharyngeal, nasopharyngeal area. And maybe that is what was picked up by RT-PCR. Maybe that doesn't actually mean that he got actually the disease. Infection simply mean when a virus starts replicating in our body, then we say it is infecting us. It doesn't mean it is causing a disease. So if maybe the patient had the virus here, maybe the just remember we talked about the boat study as well, in which they had said that the three patients or three people were convalescent. <coughs> Excuse me, they had the neutralizing antibodies, but when they came back, one of them showed positive, weak, positive RT-PCR, and they thought that maybe on the way out, he did receive some viral load from other people, and that virus was still sitting there while the immune system was taking care of it. And that is possible. If I got infected today, and I go and am in a setting where there are more COVID-19 patients, I will receive the COVID-19. I haven't developed a shield. The only thing is when I'll receive it, my body would be able to re respond to it and kill it. So the patient was asymptomatic. Was he transmitting? We don't know. They have not given us that data. 
And then there is an interesting uh, thing over here that says virus strain was different. 24 nucleotides were different. But here is the interesting thing. If you look at it, I had to do some digging for this because I don't believe that there is reinfection possible like this. So over here, they said, this article said, look at this. A stat news article reports that the genetic makeup of the sequence virus from the patient's second infection had 24 nucleotides building blocks of the virus's RNA genome that were different from the SARS-CoV-2 isolated that infected him the first time. So I said, fine, let's go and look into this article. So I had already opened it here, but I just clicked the link for you to kind of make sure that you are also looking at it. And there is no discussion of the genome here. So if I search for nucleotides, so there was a difference of 24 nucleotides, the letters that make up the RNA, sorry. So it is here. The problem is that the nucleotide differences are arriving. So sorry, I actually did not see it in the first one. The, the next strain shows thousands of strains of this virus. And we have done this discussion many times that the, if, virus, if this virus has to bind with our cell and has to infect it, it needs to have an integral spike protein. So this genome difference should not be taken as God, the virus has now mutated and it is going to reinfect us again and the vaccines would fail and the virus would just not leave us alone. It is not the case. So far, I'm not convinced. Once more data comes out, we'll look more into it. That is why I wanted to catch us up, and then we'll follow these later on. Now, can a person be reinfected? That is the basic question. So look, it depends upon the health status of a person. Let's say there is a person who is immunocompromised. Let's say they are going through the bone marrow transplant, and their white blood cells are suppressed. That person can continue to have the infection or can become reinfected. Let's say a person has uh, some immune system disease in which their immune system is not working correctly. Can they be reinfected? Yes. HIV patient, can they be reinfected? Yes. So reinfection depends upon the health status of a person as well and their immune system status. Then it is also possible that there is a carrier behavior that we have not yet figured out that the COVID-19 can cause carrier state or not. I know that there are some article and hypothesis sitting out there that says that the COVID-19 can go and hide in immune privileged sites. And we'll do a discussion about that. I'm still researching it. The, the, the website that has that article up has asked me a couple of times to uh, look into their article and talk about it. But I want to do a research because that hypothesis is fine. But we have immune privilege sites a lot in our body. For example, testis are immune privilege site because we don't want the sperms to, sperms are a foreign material for our body. They are uh, haploid cells. So our immune system would go and kill them and we don't want them to kill them. So the testicular area is uh, immune privileged. So similarly, there are other areas that are immune privileged, but we haven't seen COVID-19 sitting in there like this. Then people bring up the uh, long holler that maybe they are the immune privilege site where the virus is sitting. And I haven't yet seen any of such concept. So maybe that is the case. Maybe a person becomes a carrier just like we have carriers in hepatitis. So we'll have to continue to follow this. And I have to look at the data a little more. I They have not published the data. Then it is possible that the person actually has incorrect testing. And then it is possible that, as I discussed before, the person got re-exposed, just like in the boat study. And the person has the virus in their nose and their pharynx, and their body is going to take care of it. But if you take the RT-PCR, you expose someone, and then you take RT-PCR, you might actually get the virus there. But that doesn't mean that their immune system is not going to take care of it. For me, this is important here that the person was as asymptomatic. That means their immune system was doing its job. So I am not yet convinced that this is the world's first case of reinfection. And I felt bad about the media to start portraying it that way. So hopefully this is, uh, again, my, my opinion here from the immunology. I do not know exactly the data 
to be able to say what really is happening there. Next news. So here, um, so this is a this is asymptomatic children carry higher COVID nineteen viral load than adults in ICUs. Very interesting heading. And even when I started looking at it, I I went wow. So there are asymptomatic children who have more virus than ICU patients. And then something clicked. So let, let me discuss that with you here. Look, asymptomatic children having vi viral load is fine. We know that, that the children's natural killer cells, cross reactivity, and many other things, we have talked about it many times, can actually handle the virus much better. So that means they may have viral load in their nasopharyngeal area, but still not show a lot of symptoms, or may even be asymptomatic, and they may be spreading as well. And I know that some of the folks who say that the schools should open and the spread does not occur, I'm not going to go into the political debates. I'm just talking the medicine here. So if somebody has the virus in their nasopharyngeal area, they are going to transmit that. That is just a normal given thing. Interesting thing for us is this. So this is a cool bean internal discussion now. Look, we have been talking about the stages of this disease for some time, correct? So there is a viral stage and there is an immune dysregulation stage, correct? And I know patients in the ICUs have actually moved on from the viral stage towards immune dysregulation, or they are moving on. They are in this area. So I, I actually know a patient who is in the ICU. And after a few days in ICU, his RT-PCR had become negative. But he still is suffering for four months now because his immune system was in the cytokine storm. So in my opinion, although this study is done by very reputable people, they are from Harvard, I believe. So if you see here, um, this is Mass General Hospital. So again, very respectable. Then over here, Mass General Hospital again, um, Harvard Medical School. Harvard Medical School. So of course, I would I would give this at fine. They know more than us. They they have studied from elite colleges, fine, or they're working in elite areas. But comparing a per person, may that be a child or an adult who is in the viral stage to a person who is in the immune dysregulation stage, and then say, well, this guy has more virus than this. That is wrong. This guy, this stage will have more virus compared to this stage. So I thought that this comparison was incorrect. So if you look here in their results, a total of 192 children, I hope you can read it, uh, mean age 10 to 7 were enrolled. 49 children were diagnosed with acute SARS-CoV-2 infection. An additional 18 children met the criteria of Miss C, which they <laughs> talk about over here, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. So that is inflammation. So multi-system, that means it is spreading in the body. And then only 25 of children with acute SARS-CoV-2 infection presented with fever, symptoms of SARS-CoV-2 infection, if present, were non-specific. So they're saying that there were some children who did not have the symptoms. Okay. Nasopharyngeal viral load was highest in children in the first two days of symptoms. Yes, that should be the case. And that should happen in adults as well. If we have the first two days of symptoms, we are in the viral stage. Significantly, significantly higher than hospitalized adults with severe disease. So they are saying first two days of this has more virus than this. Yeah, sure. What's the what's the big news here? And so um, 
I, I was not very impressed by this study, or maybe it is my lack of knowledge and my ignorance that I'm not able to understand what they're doing. Maybe I need to dig deeper. And that is why I said in the beginning, maybe I need to go deeper into these studies to kind of then come back and see what is happening. Maybe they are talking about children in this stage and adults in this stage. But at least what I'm reading here says nasopharyngeal viral load was highest in children in the first two days of symptoms. First two days of symptoms are not usually the ICU patients. And they are comparing them to the patients in the ICU. Anyways, so um, that is an interesting news as well. Then I wanted to discuss a couple of more news. Florida confirmed almost 9,000 new COVID-19 cases. So here, this again, media has done. Let me back up for a second. I am not of the opinion that people, sh children should go to the colleges or universities or schools or whatever for studies. Everybody knows that. And I get lots of heat for that as well. Having said that, many of the news outlet said Florida had 9,000 new cases in one day. I can actually Google it for you and you would see it. 9,000 new cases in Florida on in one, I wish I can type in one day. And you would see many, look at this. Florida records 9,000 new coronavirus cases in a day. And then there was somebody who said, Florida has 9,000 new cases in one day, a record shattering number. But I felt that this was a little more reasonable because they had talked about in 15 days. They may... <coughs> Excuse me. Florida may have reported it on day in one day, but this time frame was 15 days. So I wanted to correct this for some of the um, media folks as well who may be listening. Second thing is, yes, it is dangerous to send children to schools because even if we say that the death rate in the infected children is 0.2 percent, which we know that that is the case. And as the ch children's age go becomes greater than 18, this death rate increases. So 0.2% means one child out of 800 infect 500 infected children. So if we have 9,000 infected children, that means 18 children are, from a statistical point of view, going to die. Whose children are these? Why are we sacrificing our children like this? I'm sorry, I'm strong about it, but I don't see the children need to be going to schools. They can stay at home. They're not going to go and work and earn something. So, but I wanted to correct that. This is not one day, it is 15 days. Okay, next. There is one more news here. And that is the six feet may not always be enough for social distancing, new reports suggest. And I, <clears throat> we had done this discussion in the past, in the very early time when I did the discussion about masks. And I remember I said, it really depends how much a person is, how forcefully a person is transmitting. If I cough, <coughs> I could be transmitting up to 20 feet or sneeze can go up to 20. The droplets from sneeze can go up to 20 feet. We know that it's not new science. And if I just talk, let's say talk lightly, it is possible that what is coming out of my mouth is just going one or two feet. If I shout, it may go five or six feet. So this is again, not a new thing. It just seems like trying to scare people that six feet, feet is not always enough. Yes, that is correct. It is not always enough. And that means we should wear masks. Yes, we should try to stay away as much as possible. We should wash our hands. We should uh, take our supplements. We should not go out unnecessarily and all that. That should be done. And I wanted to respond to one of the, um, one of the person's comment who had said, on one end, Dr. Mubin, you are saying that we are nearing the end of COVID-19. On the other end, you say, don't go out. So I have a very simple logic here. 
I don't know how and when we might get an infection. Even for my own self, whenever I rarely go out, I feel that maybe I'll catch it. So anybody is at risk. Nobody has a license that I would not get the infection. My request is that we are reaching the end of this thing now. Don't put yourself at an unnecessary risk. Because the virus is still out there, virus is still spreading, we can take care of ourselves. Why not? So I wanted to make sure that this is also not something new and this is not something alarming. We know it depends upon the force of the ejection of the droplets. Plus then the, the humidity and then the temperature and then the indoors versus outdoors. There are many factors, wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. So all those factors will uh, contribute to finally decide how far the virus went. <clears throat> Then one more interesting news, and this is for the Pakistan's cases. And I've been talking about Pakistan for some time. It is really interesting that Pakistan's cases have really plummeted. And <clears throat> I want to talk about one more thing over here, that whenever I talk about the cases, I always get the responses, sometimes even get the emails, sometimes angry emails, sometimes educational emails for me to say, hey, we are testing more. Look, testing more, you are correct, will cause revelation of more cases. Agreed. However, testing more has no bearing on number of deaths. We can't say that we tested more, so there are more deaths. Or we tested less, so there are less deaths. Testing more is only going to talk about the number of cases. May that be Sweden or may that be US or Pakistan or India or wherever. So one cannot say I would test less and somehow the number of deaths would go down as well. That's not going to happen. So what is interesting here is that the number of deaths in Pakistan have gone down a lot. I have been talking about the coronavirus. Uh, uh, wards are closed. The ICUs are closed. Uh, people are just, it, the death rate is really down. So if you see here, <clears throat> it is interesting to see why this happened. But I was looking at some data over here. <laughs> so that is Kyrie. Luffy has a very loud sound. Kyrie has lesser, louder sound. Uh, <clears throat> so here they talked about Pakistan is still only testing 0.1%. That's fine. If they tested more, they can get more cases. But the number of deaths is look at this, the number of deaths are really low. So here, instead, recorded deaths fell sharply and now hover around 20 per day. The daily tally of cases has fallen from more than 6,000 each day to well below 1,000, and restaurants have reopened and re lockdown is there. And Pakistan has recorded a total of 290,000 cases and 6,200 deaths. So this is an interesting news as well. Um, then, uh, this is the complement system. I just wanted to keep this over here. And that's it. So I hope that the discussion today, at least in terms of latest media cycles of uh, a good news in this all hydroxychloroquine discussion, that is a good news. And then the Florida uh, school children, one day 9,000 is incorrect. Then reinfection, I don't think that that is a, even if it is a possibility, then it is one in 24 million so far. So um, I'm not very much convinced over there as well. And then I wanted to make sure that we look at Pakistan as well. Please do some uh, research on Pakistan and India both. I have been asked a lot to talk about India. My problem so far is I haven't been able to find a good place to look at the data. So if somebody from India can tell me a place where I can go and see their data, which I can then say it is credible data, then I can talk about it. Um, otherwise, I can talk about generally that what is India's case rate and death rate, but that is not sufficient discussion. So this is where we are at. Please don't remember that. Uh, don't forget that this Friday, this Saturday, we'll have Dr. Subhasri with us. 
She is from India. She is very, very active for the uh, coronavirus management. She is a big proponent of vitamin D. She feels that the vitamin D levels are low in Indian population. Nutritional balances are not correct. So I wanted to have her with me to talk about India. So this Saturday, we'll have her uh, with us. So if you have any questions for her, mostly in the uh, context of vitamin D and nutritional status, then please put that down. And I'm also trying to reach out to Michael Mina from Harvard and uh, Dr. Brody from Australia to talk about uh, uh, Michael Mina's uh, epidemiology discussions and uh, Dr. Brody's uh, ivermectin discussion. So this is where we are at. Uh, please like, subscribe and share and we will meet again tomorrow. Thank you.